from what I could find out through this class, it's the TA that creates this kind of site for their own class. And then some of the proceeding options in the Teaching Lab today, Wednesday's edition. Um, we are talking about student tech choices, and one of the thoughts that we want to get is we would like to explore. Oh, I need to do this. Students actually use. Um, we, of course, as good university employees, want them to use Canvas and we want them to use all of the vetted tools that um, that we provided them. But as with any adult, um, well, as with any situation, people don't always do what we want them to do. Right, so how are they learning? What are their learning habits? What are their practices? Um, I think that if we knew a little bit more about what their practices were, we could probably become better instructors. So I want to start exploring this. Um, what do you want to do here since you came? Um, what are some topics that you want to make sure that we cover or try to cover before you leave today so that this is a useful session for you? Would anybody like to start? JT, you look like you're ready to start. <laughs> um, I'm very intrigued by the academic fraud versus 21st century learning that you proposed. Oh, yeah. Um, and from a foreign language background, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to say the most experience that I have with academic fraud um, is actually students using Google Translator. I've been passing that off as a own work as a sort of personal experience with that. Um, I had a student footnote the URL citation as the translator. But it was a translator. I mean, wow. it works for them? No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so what is fraud anymore is is on the board. James, are you interested in sharing next? I, I, I mean I'm just this is a topic that I find interesting and so I'm all right. As best as we can. Very good. Tom? Uh, I would say I'm most interested in integrating third party things into Canvas. Okay, what well, integration options do we have? How that works, and even if that's possible, does it work not well? Um, so, when, when to just avoid third party and just. I'm going to call it integration issues, and the university has a lot to say about that. Charles. Oh, um, hi everyone. I'm Charles. Um, I am also probably most interested in integration options. Okay. And Reggie. Uh, I'm curious more about this the, the idea of fraud and what it, what constitutes fraud, and how students. See, I don't know how you're going to write this, but how students um, prize efficiency. Prize so. Let me give you an example. So, um, if I, there are a number of places you can go to find the answers to those online platform quizzes, um, like, gosh, like Chegg and places like that, that just list it. Now, we don't want students to do that. That is, I would call that edging on academic integrity issues. But they're seeing it as efficiencies. 
this getting through. All right, efficiency in the collaboration, real world versus academic. Good, Colleen? Um, like Mosa said, I'm, I'm interested in seeing what um, students are using to make things in class run more efficiently um, and, you know, maybe consider, you know, bringing those things up for adoption so we could use them in five years when they're finally approved. <laughs> <laughs> At which point? <laughs> um, I'm going to take out of that, um, well, it's sort of the integration issues, but also the, um, oh, the speed of change. Because in five years, when they get approved, they will no longer be used because they will be replaced. So, I'm going to call it keeping up. Good. Andrew? I kind of fall into the keeping up camp. I think broadly I'm just more interested in like what students are using now. I was a student until last August, and mm -hmm. I still know that I'm behind the times. Um, and you're in technology, so you should be like on the cutting edge. Yeah, literally. You think you're no longer on the vanguard. Of course not. I, I never really was, I suppose. Okay. <laughs> I would like to, to talk about LTI integration for teachers. Because, you know, you guys with Sokapin account, privileges can do things that a normal teacher can. And there is no, as far as I know, no recourse to a teacher to request those things, is there? There is. There is. It's called the help desk. and. Well, but then it won't be the teacher doing it, it will be someone that do it, doing it for the teacher. Oh, ah, right? right. So it'll be the what if teacher going teacher, through that process. Right. That's funny, at this exact time right now, upstairs there's a Canvas Features Request Group meeting that I'm on, that I'm missing that meeting, um, where we talk about what are the processes for instructors to suggest and ask for things. Some red, yeah. yeah. That's why I'm recording this one so I can be there right now. Is that? Um, my main goal coming here was to find out what others are using, what students are using, right. how, 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 how they're integrated. Um, but the fraud issue is interesting, mm -hmm. and I'm just curious to hear more about that. And um, also, I had an in instance that um, the I mean, you use Google Apps, Google Docs, but they would log in through their private, or they somehow manage to flip it to their private Google account, oh, nice. and then okay. it's like, I can't see the activity. Mm -hmm. Luckily, the student was doing great work, it's just was in her terms, mm -hmm. not the course's terms. So I don't know how to manage that either. I guess I could just say, you know, you're going to do it this way, but if they're working well, I love this. This is a, a theme I keep going back to all the time in these labs. You'll probably sick of it at this point. It's learning on their terms, right? It's using the technology that they use rather than, oh, you're going to make me sign in with my WISC account that I never use because I've never used it in the past and I'm very comfortable and all my files are already on this other thing that I've got set up for me. <sighs> yeah. Um, that's a big part, agency, we know, is a big part of learning. Can we, what can we do as instructors to give the students as much choice as possible, to take down as many of our external barriers as we can so that they can use the tools that they're comfortable with, that their peers and friends are using and have their own um, agency ability to do the work they want to do the way they want to do it in their own terms. Erwin. Um, piggybacking on that idea of tearing down barriers, uh, how do you feel about putting out barriers just so students get a 
in classroom taste of what it means to join, you know, the workforce where they will have to do X, Y, and C, and it's like, oh, we didn't do that. It's like, well, do you want to work here? A great, great example. I think I may have shared before the um, that was an argument that was used in the '80s as. Um, high schools across the country were deciding, do we go with Apple or do we go with PCs? And everybody was like, oh, they've got to use Windows because when they get out, they're going to have to learn how to use Windows 95. Which, or of course, is, uh, I find that there are good arguments on, on that side. So well, it, ideally, we want them to use broader tools rather than be indoctrinated in, into one system. So. Word processors, yes, we want them to know, to know that. Um, how to search the internet, yes, we want to know them to know how to do that critically. Um, do we need to lock them into a specific system? Should we do that? Is it the school's responsibility to, in, you know, to, to get them into that? It's, it's, in some cases, it is. In specialty schools, where they're going to be um, I'm thinking of some scientific equipment. They need to learn how to use that equipment because that's the prevalent way. That's the authentic tool in the industry. They should learn that. Um, but the idea of a microscope in general, rather than this particular microscope, they should also know how to do, how to extrapolate and transfer those skills. Um, so, how how well would you say? Uh, let's see, that you know what students are using today. If you are totally with it, 10 out of 10, raise your hand. How about 5 out of 10, you've heard of some of their things, okay. <laughs> 1 out of 10, you really have no clue other than like, hopefully they're using Canvas because I see them log in, <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> How do we keep up with that? With learning analytics happening on campus, we are looking at how long, how often they log into Canvas, how often they use our Canvas supported, you know, our campus supported tools, because we have data on that, some data on that, um, and some of it's accurate, some of it sort of meaningless without a lot of interpretation. But how how do we find out whether they're using GroupMe or Snapchat for sharing answers? Um, or if they're using, I don't know, a, a myriad of other tools that are available out there. Is it important that we know? Can we design our classrooms regardless of what tools they're using and say, to Marjean's point, this is just an efficient way to learn. I am a student who has learned to navigate my environment by employing tools that are out there to be more efficient at doing the tasks that you asked me to do. Is it my fault that you're asking me to do tasks that are very easy with the tools that I have? No, <laughs> it's not my fault. Is it my responsibility to tell you that I'm doing these, making light or making the easy work out of things that you found really, really hard? Yeah, maybe, maybe not, probably not. Um, would I benefit from doing it your old fashioned way? Writing my dissertation on a typewriter? No! My gosh, that's a, that changed just, the, the typewriter changed everything in, in grad school, or moving from the typewriter to the word processor. That moving from the library stacks to the internet changed everything about it. It changed expectations. Is having apps like GroupMe going to change, should it? change our expectations of what the students do and what they use and how they learn. I JT, mean, wait. Yeah, no, go for it. Well, so from the example of Chad, I get having the uh, answer key solution um, at your availability, or you're just checking out the library and using that answer key to solve your own problem set in five minutes. Yes, it is a question of efficiency. You can do it in almost immediately copy and paste, but it's misrepresentation. You've misrepresented your entire process in yourself. And I think that has to account for something, whether you get a hundred on the exam, good for you. Um, but I mean, this is my opinion personally, but you cheated to get there. And you know, because you have that resource at your disposition, does it mean that you should pass it off as your own work? Uh -huh. I don't think that that's 
necessarily Well, yeah. by myself, I went to that Chegg resource mm -hmm. and I got the answers. Right. That is my own work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 the same is true for Google Translate, right? You've written yep. a paper in copy, or allegedly written a paper in English, perhaps copied and pasted it into French. You did the work, but you misrepresented how you got to the final product. Right. I didn't do the work the way that you wanted me to do it or we that you expected me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different, I think that's a little bit of a different thing. Um, but but I, I think that if you, there's a, a bit of a flawed design in if they can go to check and quickly look up the answers. So it goes, to me, that goes back to course design and saying, what exactly do I want them to get out of this activity that I'm asking them to do? Is it busy work? Am I asking them to do, to, check their understanding of this information and do this multiple choice quiz um, that is connected to the textbook. I, I don't, I don't know. I, there, and it's some, yeah. So this is like me in yeah. fifth grade or whatever it was that I learned long form algebra, uh, not algebra, division. <laughs> I don't even know my terms. Um, well, whole with that whole. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't learn, I never learned how to <laughs> show my work, right? The instructor always, my teacher would always say, solve the problem and show your work, right? If they cut and paste into Google Translate, their work involves a screen capture video of them cutting and pasting into, into that, right? For some things, it's easy to show your work and long form division is one of them, right? Because you. Had, you were taught a single way to do this thing, or maybe there's two ways to do long form division, but generally the way to do it. And you were given plenty of space on your paper underneath the question to show that whole thing. That showed your work, that showed that you, know, you made choices along the way, and this is how you did it. In projects, paper projects that are scaffolded, where it would be say, first give me a proposal, mm -hmm. then give me a rough draft, then give me a second draft, and then give me the final draft. That is a scaffolded thing that shows the work. That is not very, it's, you can't use essay Yoda to, or Yoda essay or whatever it's called, to do that work for you. So that's changing the way that you're, changing your expectations to meet your desires. Also understanding like the reason you know people have to use things like uh, multiple choice platforms and things like that is the efficiency of scale too. So there's give and take. You may want to create all these amazing like writer response or reflection, and you have 500 students, and you just can't. Right. And things will fall through the crack then, be cracks then because. And students will take advantage of those cracks and and the resources that are available and they will find them. You asked how would we find out about what they're using? Yeah. I think if you have TAs, they can be the ultimate spies. Yeah, the, the over the shoulder. So if is they have conversations, they might actually also be using these things too. I don't mean in a bad way, spies. <coughs> well, is it Conflict covert is this is this a covert activity? Is this a thing that we need to it's us versus them? I have my tools to go to get the job done. So does anybody are un, you know is anybody unhappy with me using what resources are available to me? To get are you job cheating done? to finish your job? <laughs> <laughs> I, I finish my job. So. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to show the work though. No, it's just about the yeah, If you have to, if you're asking your students to show the work, that is a problem. I can see that. But um, learning shouldn't be difficult either. <laughs> Oh, well, learning should be a little bit difficult, right? We want it to be a little bit uncomfortable so that there's, you know, discomfort and growth, but not so much that it's overwhelming. Colleen? I was just thinking, like, maybe if you could make it kind of a collaborative part of your class where you reach out and you say, yeah, how can we make this easier? And then, you know, embrace that technology and, and you know, maybe research it yourself and then come back at them and say, yeah, this is really useful for this. Um, but when it comes time to either when you have to use your real world application or at the very least take the assessment for your course, that's not going to help you. So right. 
you know, it's fine in a pinch, but um, I, I just think, I think students are, you know, kind of willing to share some of their resources so far as they aren't like horribly nefarious, <laughs> like, oh yeah, we have this right. guy who writes our essays for us. But I, I think they're usually willing to, you know, share like, oh, look at this cool new application we got. And it becomes like a learning opportunity, I guess. For the instructors, and I think also for the students that aren't aware of it yet. So if as a student, I find this really cool tool that helps me do the job that I'm being asked to do easier, is it ethical for me to keep that to myself? Or is the ethical thing to do be, would it be to share it out with the rest of my students as a collaborative act of generosity <laughs> <laughs> and to make everybody's life easier? I, ah. I had the privilege of being a TA for a physical science lab course, and so I got to know the students pretty well and had those over the shoulder moments. Uh, and that's how I found out about Quizlet mm -hmm. because the student was doing this, this flashcard thing. It wasn't even flashcards, like Quizlet is built for flashcards, but what do they use it for? They use it for intergenerational course content moving. Got it. Um, Transfer of knowledge. Yeah, exactly, which is learning, I guess. Yeah, um, I mean, that's what the instructors are doing, right? <laughs> we build a whole course and in order from last year to next year to move that knowledge yeah. down, and here the students are helping us. Yeah, and so I saw it, uh, I saw the website, and I saw, I recognized her course content, but it was in a weird format. So I was like, hey, what are you looking at? Fortunately. Oh yeah, it's Quizlet. Somebody from last year uploaded all of your <laughs> exams, and I was like, "Oh, that's awesome! Show me more." And he was like, "Wait, really? Like, you want to show this?" And he like kind of tried to sh shut his laptop. I was like, "No, no, no, no! You're you're doing whatever you want. Like, this is fine. You're you're uh, fulfilling objectives. It's just you're you're being efficient. Yeah. and collaborative. Yeah, great real world skills in our disciplines. Yeah, and so we embraced it and leaned into it and just said, "Hey." Uh, don't post our previous exams, but other students are free to. Um, so go on Quizlet if you want to find it. We didn't uh, sanction using that for like official study material because um, there's no answer key and there's no support. And a lot of times um, students can like scan their exam and even with handwritten stuff, it'll just automatically go into Quizlet. And it's really efficient. But sometimes I was looking through all all the archives of our course content on Quizlet, and a lot of times the answers are wrong. <laughs> yeah. um, so we didn't like sanction it, but it was like an easy hands-off way of like a little nod to the cheaters. Mm -hmm. But also, um, it got us kind of it made our jobs a little more efficient because we weren't the gatekeepers of previous courses. Yeah. Like I said if somebody posted on Quizlet, that's fine. Uh, don't. Don't come to us for previous exams. What do you mean about the cheaters? Like a uh, just this is a third party thing that previous generations of students have used, um, and we don't. It's part of the territory, right? Yeah, we're it's, not explicitly like allowing it per se, but we're just kind of saying it's there. We're not disallowing it. I'm just saying that don't have coming in and yeah. what's cheating. Yeah. So you're not to the cheaters, but like. Uh, it's just because if you're a, if you're sort of implicitly saying that this is fine because it's already out there, that's not really cheating. It's just no, a game. no, 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 it's not. No, it and flips I, it away from cheating then into studying for the exam because my presumption is that you've changed the exams then. Yeah, yeah, we change them every year, but um, it was a nice like study guide that some people use. Mm -hmm. um, so, so while it's efficient for the, the cheaters, is like not. I think it's helpful to frame it as like a nod to the cheaters. It's sort of like you're aligning culture with like culture of a classroom, you know? Like this might be considered cheating in the world, but in this classroom, like it's something that we know exists. And yeah, okay. and we can't control it, so we might as well lean into it. Yeah. Well, it's good for some things, it's not good for everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. My favorite like integration though is, is stuff that like is centered on Canvas, but then allows them to use their group tech Oh, how to how to connect your 
Canvas calendar to your Google Calendar or Outlook calendar. Yeah. yeah. Like I didn't know how to do that either. Yeah. I don't know if students are doing that, but... No, not that, not my students. Have. So, and yeah. that maybe brings up another question. To what extent should we help students do things like this so that they know better? And if we say, here, eat this life cereal, it's good for you, will they do it? Or will they say, whatever? Well, I, I kind of like the giving them a workaround because it, like, it's a nod saying, like, hey, Canvas Calendar or uh, Canvas Calendar isn't the best tool. Or, you're, or maybe it's the best tool, but it's not the one that you use. Yeah. You're a Google Yeah, your calendar is here and your Canvas Calendar is here. Here's how to actually get it together. So I, those are my favorite kind of third party use. Yeah. Tech how can we play well together? Yeah, how do we make Canvas work for you? Because a lot of students come to me and say, like, I hate Canvas. I'm such a Canvas phobe. I'm not a tech person. And they're just kind of like, identify as that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have a couple pages in our syllabus. In some ways it is, and yeah. you, if you went through that Reddit thread as I did, yeah. and I remember seeing that Piazza comment like, why don't they just use Piazza? Yeah. It would work just as well, and it's sanctioned mm -hmm. um, for that. Why do students use things like GroupMe? Because Piazza isn't there, probably. Because what? Because Piazza isn't there, probably. But yeah. at least so, in that sometimes case. because alternatives aren't there. Right. Others I are James. So there's also a big thing, they want to be, they want to belong, they want to be part of a group. And what's the best group to be part of? That secret group that lets you work together that other students don't know of, about. So um, I remember reading, and I don't know if it was that thread or if it was a, another thread on Reddit about um, students said, yeah, the fact that they use GroupMe was a terrible thing because it's so open. You should use Snapchat. And, talked about students using Snapchat for a lot of the let's transfer content from this test mm -hmm. to your brain um, or Discord or, or Telegram or, or some of the other encrypted much more secure messaging apps and when you do that you can have a group of friends it's a secret society that is all working together so that you succeed it is a cohort of learners if you will um, and is it bad to have a cohort of learners? No, we know that that's great for success. Well, we encourage them to learn by group. <laughs> we, I say that because we've never occurred in but this summer I have two students who turned in exactly the same writing assignment. And, and I talked to them and what's going on and they're like, well, we were overwhelmed so we did video chatting and we were taking notes so our Papers turn out to be well. No, it's just you could you could do, but I mean they never deny <laughs> you work together, and we encourage them to work together. Yeah. I just had to, but the product was so bad. I still got oh dear. Because the outcome is that it's supposed to be better by working together. It, it didn't good. work. Okay. But the point is, like they thought they were helping each other, and that was okay. But they never realize, oh, I should just keep our conversation and discussion in mind and write my own thing. That never occurred to them. So it was like down to the spelling errors. Oh dear. It was, it was cutting kind of copy and paste job. I mean, it was bad. And I put a note in, I asked the advisors to put a note in their record. So, hmm. 
So let's start thinking strategically, maybe, about what we can do, what are some strategies to live in this world as instructors. We could fight it, right? We could say, as the University of uh, Austin, Texas Austin instructor did, at the beginning, you sign a, a pledge that says you won't share any lesson or note things with each other. Academic honesty, no plagiarism, no sharing of, of notes. Will that work? <laughs> if you can enforce it. <laughs> yeah, my doctor made me sign a thing that says I will meditate, I never have. <laughs> you know, we're taping this, right? It's on this live video. I'm a bad meditator. <laughs> All right. Here's something to I uh, give to my class because I have sat in this car lot with you. Uh, the last time I taught 311, uh, first day of class, I gave him a piece of text in a book. And I asked him to write it for me, and they all gave me yes. And I told them, and this is what I took it from a novel that won the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Prize. Oh, the Nobel Prize of Literature from this Latin American writer, and I just run it through Google. And it's like, here, how does this person, how much does he get? And that kind of like caught that semester GDP with online a lot um, on the basis of they realized that the English version of that novel was crap. And it's like, that's what you put me through when you give me. That's <laughs> 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 work. Okay, that's a semester. So uh, you built empathy with, or they, you built empathy in them for your job by saying, don't put me through what I just put you through. I wrote examples of bad cheating. <laughs> sure if examples you're gonna of cheating. Cheat well. <laughs> if you're going to cheat, cheat well. Yeah, number one rule of cheating, don't get caught. Yeah, right? I know if you use Google Translate, this is what will come out. Or a literary piece. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. 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 right, this was good in Spanish. Are there, there are suggestions that you have about creating um, or, be, or sort of insisting the importance of um, language and of scaffolding activity? Yeah. But I just sort of wonder, and it's a concern sort of time wise, are you scaffolding the activity to prevent plagiarism or are you actively designing this to insist on the process itself? Oh. And I think for some people that could be a very fine line, you, know, you feel as though cheating is inevitable, so I need to draw this out in the classroom because I don't think they're capable of doing it themselves. Um, sort of designing their own writing assignments themselves, or is it you're really insisting on each individual step in the process as an independent learning of objective in itself? I'm in a weird space right now because I'm both a professional educator and also a student. And uh, so I'm looking at things as multiple, from multiple perspectives. Um, and I see my own behaviors because I'm also a mom and work full time, of finding efficiencies the best I can, knowing full well that I'm missing out by doing that. You know, I'm compromising my own learning. So I think that when I think about scaffolding an activity, it is a matter of helping it create efficiencies. Because I, inevitably, if I wait to the last minute, both my quality of product and my stress level are through the roof, and I'm not also so I wouldn't necessarily make kids write a, students write a rough draft and have me check it, although I have done that if I have a small enough class. Um, but to make them do the thinking, spread out the thinking, spaced learning a little bit. Distributed, distributed learning, mm -hmm. also very good. The other thing that it, I think scaffolding activities does is it gives them a chance to personalize the learning. Mm -hmm. So if you ask for an essay on some obscure topic that has nothing to do with their lives and who they are and what they, what their passions and dreams and experiences are, they might as well just get it from the internet and pay Yoda essay twenty five bucks a page for that essay Yoda. I don't know what it is. Um, it's just it's just one of a thousand out there. Um, no, I, I I think it's only fifteen bucks a page. I, you, how good of a paper do you want, basically? <laughs> so, so, okay, well, I had one student 
who was not writing pretty good essays, and then all of a sudden there were like three amazing essays. <laughs> no. The last one was bad, and I'm like, what happened here? But I have, it's an online course, I have no way of knowing. So th apparently there's something else there that helps well, out. Well, and on your first paragraph of the activity sheet, we talk about turn it in, which is now being turned on for campus. It's on already. It's uh, on. It is, it is being turned on, meaning that it's already on. And um, more and more instructors are learning about it now. Um, so that would be one way to find out yeah. if those essays were written and used in other places oh, and documented. Yeah. There's also the question of, can, is there, is what we're asking them to produce, and I'm not, I wasn't an English teacher, so I'm not working on essays at all, but, um, but is there another way to accomplish that learning objectives or for them to show what they know that is less Googleable? Is that a new adverb? Sure, go for it. Definitely. <laughs> Googleability? <laughs> Search. I mean, I, I did copy and paste the essay in the Google search <laughs> box, <laughs> just up. like in a very primitive way, because I'm also pressed for time, too. Yeah. And nothing turned out, but I, I thought maybe the student hired someone to write something, because yeah. it was like, read this paper, answer these questions. I mean, it's a synthesis. Turnitin won't ever catch those, you know, yeah. individual students who make who pay for college by writing papers for other people, and they are really good at what they do, and you know, yeah. we all do what we have to do to get through college in some ways. The, speaking on the point of um, how do we know what tech the students are using, and how do we figure out what, what what's popular in that cohort and what they're using it for, the BioCore program enlists like a small cohort mm -hmm. of individuals, so like, not the informants, but they, they call themselves the board of directors. Uh -huh. um, and that's a that's a nice thing to get around like large scale classes too, um, that you may not have the kind of personal interaction that you can figure out on a student to student basis what tech they're using. But I, I kind of like that model of like informants. Yeah, the board of directors. Um, and I think that like many people, like your experience, Nizan, they do not, they don't see what they did as necessarily being bad. They're happy to do what you want them to. You just have to be very clear and direct, uh, direct them because they just think that they're being efficient, many of them. Some don't. We're on fraud. We're, it's all kind of going on to this idea of what's efficient versus what's gaming the system versus is that good or is that bad or is that just a new way of learning like the word processor was. So I'm trying a new thing. Um, and I think it's working for me. I was talking to the textbook and it's beautifully done and all these thousands of electronic models and each of the videos. Students have been working on this problem, these problems for 20 years. We've fully vetted. They're great. There's thousands of them. Never seen one of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And some of them are, I mean, it's just physics for, uh, they've been discussing them, or it might be illegal. So I was, so I decided that, uh, to leverage it. So um, what I decided to do is I assign them random problems for their homework. And then their exams are exactly from all those problems. They just don't know which problem to do. So now if they want to go learn 5,000 problems and solutions, <laughs> I'm, and they can reproduce that 50 minutes on a random problem, I'm like, you win. Yeah. My job is done. Yeah. Right? So I don't have any problem with them Google solutions. Uh, the more they do, it might even show up on that exam. Yeah. The more they do, mm -hmm. the more practice. Right. So now they're motivated. It's like, oh, I'm going to go read them all. <laughs> or actually, I'm going to go work them all because this read a solution is going to help you. So you make them also show the work. So they, don't have, they can't just plug in a solution. 
in the in their homework they can. The principal, although no, I mean the numbers are randomized, so it's maybe more difficult. But the logic they could get, uh, but that's not going to help them do the test. Yeah. So they have a motivator for doing that, and in fact, the supplemental <coughs> is whatever they get on their homework, put it on the test, and so it's a test right there. It's very closely aligned. So the assessment is exactly. But anyway, on the fraud thing, it's like, uh, you know, that we lost. Yeah. And just, you know, <laughs> yeah. own it, right? It's gone. You can do, you know, policing and so on and turn it in, but we lost that game 10 years ago. No, a uh, hundred years <laughs> ago. It's always been there in some form. Yes. I know, I know, but not so accessible. So my approach now, and maybe you could think about it, you know, in terms of writing and stuff, is like, go ahead and, you know, Google up every essay you want, but now write me one here right now. That's, that's, your, that's the final assessment. So I can do it here right now. So my metric now is can you solve any problem in this 1,200 page book right here right now? And you can. <laughs> I'm happy. So timed in class sort of things. Yeah. And even with that, you know, they've got their watches now that they can check and they've got now, have you guys seen the Amazon earbuds? Well, we've always had the telephone earbuds and things like that so they could there are all kinds of ways to get into the real-time world as well to get answers. We've like, lost that battle as well. I like what you said, though, that word leveraging, Duncan, right? Because that's really, when we see, like, the bio core and things like that, I, I think I may have proved it as a negative. But when we ask them, is there ways that we can leverage it or let them just leverage it so they can get their job done? If they're spending this much time coming up with creative solutions to come up with answers, is that learning how to use the calculator, which is, you know, okay, um, versus, like, they're coming up with the answers, how they came up with it, they're using their social networks, they're using online research, is that terrible? It's not the learning objective that you came up with and that you put into the top of the course assignment or in the syllabus. I want you all to leave with a great understanding of how to cheat in, in this topic. Um, no, but should you have put that down as a learning objective? Or what, what is the learning objective and how do you, how do you maintain that? Sorry. I just read, and I actually did my reading this week on time for my class. Um, I just read, and there was a phrase they used in there called collective cognition. It was about problem solving and student affairs. So it wasn't like about students, but it was about student affairs professionals. But, um, but I like that idea of collective cognition, that multiple perspectives taking a look at how to solve these problems. So, so for example, sometimes students need to be able to reproduce quickly the information, but I wouldn't, like, personally wouldn't mind if it, they do a quiz together. Mm -hmm. If they really do it together, and I don't know if they are or not, but like... And that distributed cognition, collective cognition, the idea that we all have different areas and perspectives on things, whenever we can employ that as a, an instructor, that's good, because then it's not just one view of the content, but it's all these other views of the content. So if I understand not just the way that I see this, but the way that you see it, the way that you see it, the way that you see it, I have a richer understanding, you know, multiple dimensional understanding of the content. And everybody's is a little bit different. Duncan, did you tell your students to go online and search for the answers? No. Okay. But the, you know, it's common knowledge. They don't have Yeah. Or certainly. No, I actually, they, they get the full nine yards of, of academic misconduct policy and the whole thing, and, and they're subject to that as exams where I can assess it. But there, there isn't the motivation, the, like the homework prep, the slow sticks thing. Yeah. So there isn't, the motivation is just the opposite. It's not helping. Yeah. <laughs> So what I don't other know how to do this. I, mean, I, I think that for me, my particular life, well, really, it's, it's going to work really well. Uh, what I really love about it is all these problems are so are vetted. Mm -hmm. Like they've been off. You know, there's no problems. These problems work. They're not buggy. 
In fact, they're all 88 certified, <laughs> which is amazing. So for me, it works. If I were to do try to do a comparable thing in a uh, you know, more humanities type class, and actually I do, I have, I have many of my goals include communication, literacy, all kinds of things. So students write essays and stuff too, but it isn't such a big part of the class that I myself really try to you know, play through the transmission. I don't know what field are you in? Environmental science. Environmental science. Yeah. Well, you have some environmental science text uh, to use or for some courses or something. Yeah. yeah. So what other strategies can we use? Recognizing that we don't know what tools they're using but that they're probably talking amongst themselves back and forth and sharing content, sharing answers. I encourage that, so is Piazza. Mm -hmm. and the Piazza. We had talked about Piazza a little bit yeah. beforehand. So it's, you know, the policy is don't give away the answer, give them. And it's all monitored. I can see, I see every entry, so, uh, and they don't. They don't just give them the answer, they prompt. They, you know, do the right thing. So, so I promote that. I'm not sure this is the right phrasing, but I think the idea of being honest about here are the outcomes that I want you to leave. Not what's the right answer, but how do you come to the right answer. Any time that we can, or how do you come to a defendable ar argument or whatever, you know, some things don't have right answers or wrong answers. But what is the process? So anytime that we can focus on the process, whether it's scaffolding, whether it's um, randomizing the, the problem so that they need to go through the process on the spot or however, if we can share with them that the class is not about getting the right answer, because we know that when Oftentimes when 18 year olds come to college, they think that it is your job to give them the right answer and their job to sort of listen and learn all the secrets from you. And then it takes them a couple of years before they recognize that sometimes there are multiple right answers and there's different ways of getting to it. And it's not necessarily the instructor's job to teach me, but it's my job to teach myself. It's the instructor's job to help me facilitate my learning how do we get that to them earlier? Because I think that if we did get that to them earlier, then they might say, oh, I've got this answer key right here, but using it is not going to help me in my future. It'll help me in the short term with this test, but then the next test, I'm gonna be dependent on it, and the test after that, I'm gonna be dependent on it because I'm not learning the process. So can we, as instructors, reinforce in a way that is palatable and attractive to them that they should be working on the processes. JT? I was thinking something that was mentioned during the presentation on Friday, sort of self-generated utility value for the course. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I, I'm coming from a, a language learning environment, so it's not necessarily, uh, I think it was, the conversation is very heavily STEM focused, but um, generating, you know, in a fourth language class of your own value for learning, a language sharing from a cultural perspective, et cetera, might, I say might, but all, you know, all caps might turn a student away from cheating, but I know I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not alone when I say that, at least in a foreign language class, I mean that you are fighting sort of misrepresented student product on a daily basis. And I just, I struggle with how to overcome that with some of the examples that we've been given, because the process really is it's cognitive, it's yeah. language. It's not necessarily something you can immediately write down. Um, unless you just sort of give yourself a, a linguistic tree every, every second. But I just wonder, I don't know if there's any different perspective that I'm not seeing for a language classroom that. Since so you're just running through the little translator. Exactly. Yeah. Can you make them make audio recordings? Yeah, but I guess the, I mean, it's not the first class. I think the reason, in a French class, I think the reason why people cheat is because language learning is stressful. It is. And not only you're you're you think you're putting yourself in an incredibly vulnerable position because you're trying to express yourself and you can't, but other people might be able to at a higher level. 
in achieving the same goal. I mean, the easy for you guys to alleviate that stress, I think, is unique in our even in our literature classrooms in our English book. Well, and run it through Google Translate. Google Translate's getting better every day. So it might not work now, but it'll work. In some ways, it does help. It doesn't, and I'm speaking outside my subject area here, but context, syntax, like there are some things that it helps with. This word is that word, or a, one of those, one of this word, one of these words can also be one of these words as well. Right. So it'll do some of the basics, and, and that's not necessarily bad. Is it the best choice? No. Is it better than nothing? It absolutely is, otherwise Google Translate, nobody would use it, right? Mm -hmm. It helps us get the meaning across, not perfectly, but imperfectly, so it is, it is a form of learning. But, it, but it's still misrepresenting, I just go back to that, you're misrepresenting, if you write it in English and then translate it, it's cheating. What, I, mean, I, just, I, I just have a hard time mm -hmm. seeing the legitimate value of that. But on the flip side of that, for even in my own courses that I've led, um, encouraging students to write in Microsoft Word or Google, whatever, but change the language to French. Because mm -hmm. um, it catches a lot of these sort of small syntactic errors, capitalization, acronyms, things like that. I think that's different than encouraging them to write a paper in English and then copy paste that as a Google Translate and hit translate. Right. Because the language and meaning making has not been created by the students, it's been created by an algorithm. So, who do I set? Yeah. Could you have them put it through Google Translate and then they submit that and then they have to go and edit the translation? Like would that so help? Be, but even then they're editing someone else's work. Yeah. Yeah. So at the end of the day, so then the assignment I mean, isn't translate, but if you have go ahead for example, if you, they have a paragraph they write in English, they obviously in English, you know, if it's, if it's correct, they have the ability to conjugate a verb. But if they can't do that correctly in French, then the editing process doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Because they don't know how to conjugate in French. All right. Yeah. So that's why Google Translate doesn't work well um, most of the time. Well, assuming I, I would stop like that. I've used some of but not for a while. I mean, because they were crappy, but they're getting them a lot better. Um, I would leverage that. So I mean, if I can see immediately the feedback, not to type it in in French or other languages, if I can see immediately the feedback is correct, conjugated the verb wrong or whatever, I can see it in you know, a fraction seconds to the next week when it you finally know, comes around and gets graded by itself. It's fantastic. I mean, I would, would try to use that. Yeah, I we open the door saying that you can check your right, quality well, of I, your I work. That's sort of what we've been saying earlier. I think these are the tools of the game that exist. Yeah. You already use spell check and Microsoft Word. Yeah. Why not encourage that and yeah. change language in, in Word, but if you use a translator, you cheated. And that, to me, I don't know, that's just a fundamental block that I have. Well, when possible, I wonder, and, and again, it's an economy of scale and things like that, but when assignments can be closer to the authentic work, the cognitive work that people do with the, that kind of information, um, I think then it forces people, to, it's not as, first of all, it's a little bit more meaningful and they can protect potentially project, um, this is meaningful and this is how I might use this in the future. And it's harder to, if it's more authentic and they have to do their own creation process, it's harder to cheat on creation. And I'm thinking back right now, I'll just use, again, use myself as an example as a student right now. I'm thinking back and kicking myself in the butt every day that I didn't learn stats when I got an A in stats back in an, 20 years ago as an undergraduate. Because now I actually need to know how to do so and that's to, another. And now I have to reteach myself. That's another one that came up again in Marcus Brower's talk on Friday. And if you haven't seen that, at the top of the activity, not the top of the activity machine, at the top of our Canvas page, we have a link to it, and you should watch it. Having other students who have gone through, who said, "Gosh darn it, I wish I learned this last semester," or "Here's how I learned it last semester," or instead of cheating or I, I, I cheated and I didn't learn this thing, that might be, that they won't listen, they won't hear from you. They won't, but they might hear from an alumni in your program. They might hear from somebody who went through your course the previous semester. I keep going back now to JT, to your problem, to er, 
Erwin's um, idea of sharing that Google Translate mess with them. What if, as a scaffolded assignment, you said, write an essay in English, run it through Google Translate, and then fix it? I, I was, or give them something you put through Google uh, Translate and tell them what's the problem with it. Yeah. Or, or peer review. And I 100% I buy that, but for me, that sort of sets the standard that you set the tone in the classroom that I expect you're going to cheat. Hmm. Hmm. I expect so you're going to use the tools at hand, and I'm going to help you to use them in a way that's not cheating because I'm going to write it into the assignment. <laughs> well, I mean, I, what I was thinking, yeah, Google Translate can be a tool, but you know, at this level of knowledge, I think you should translate it into English. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I think we have to be clear that it's teaching them why you shouldn't rely on it by having them interact with it is a good way to do that. Yeah, it's like, don't, don't even try, because it's not going to work. Yeah, like you can't ignore it because people are going to use well, it, right? You can, right? <laughs> 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 because the reason why it exists is because it's efficient. Yeah. Um, it creates meaning, even though the meaning may be grammatically incorrect as a reader. And in my case, as a non-native speaker of French, I understand incorrect French because I myself make some of those mistakes. Meaning is shared. So you, you know, ticked all the boxes of communication, but yeah. the form is wrong. Yeah. So. It's efficient, you get it across, you know, you'll take your B or C, probably an F, <laughs> and move on, but is that okay? I mean, is that, yeah. I just, uh, I would be remiss, and I would kick myself 20 years from now if I would agree that that is sufficient. Yeah. From an educator perspective. Why are they taking yeah. any class? Like, sometimes, so, Sometimes they're sitting in a class because that is what they have to take. And we also have to deal with the reality that not everybody's going pro in the things that we are passionate interested about. and yep. passionate about. They have their other things they're doing, and your class might just be check it off and get out of there. And that is their loss, right? But um, but it's also their decision. But it's also yeah. their decision, yeah. Um, so why do we take their, yeah, helping them understand why they're taking the class. Um, I also come from a language background. I, I taught English and literature for years, and I so I understand what you mean when you say sometimes the STEM solutions aren't applicable to your area. And so I understand writing is a big component of your course, and you need them to be able to write these essays. And I was wondering, is there any way um, where they still need to write the essays, but maybe a way that they can have like a related topic on a timed in-class essay, so you can at least have them practice that skill in the essay that they were supposed to write in their own original writing, and then get to the timed class writing, and then demonstrate their French language skills in that assessment. Yeah, and I guess what I've learned, uh, timed assignments are gonna work well for me, just because I think it's gonna Immediately. Yeah. Um, no, more stress. Um, but writing workshops do create, at least in my own personal experience, of very intensely scaffolded mm -hmm. assignments yeah. do create better final output. Mm -hmm. um, but at a time, I mean, for me, writing something in 50 minutes mm -hmm. is a nightmare to deal with. But I mean, what about discussion sections where they can actually just work on their writing? Oh, I mean, in a first class every, every day. Is every day. Nice. Just get <laughs> yeah. In my writing classes, I also use scaffolding a lot. To, to, to create the, the initial building blocks or whatever they're going to write, so they can collaborate, and uh, and that seems to help a little bit. But it's not scalable because they give you all those the draft and then the first yeah. draft, and you got all those the outline, and if you get 15 students, something you can't. Know. That's right. Still That's there. too much work for the instructor. Um, I think having that discussion about what are their values can stem some of the. Do I really want to do this or not do this? What, what do I want to get out of this class? And for some of them, the answer will be, I just want to check the box and go through it. And that's OK. We all do this every day in our lives with things that we have to do that we don't want to do. right? And the fact that we have to pay for it in college in order because it's required, it's always been part of life. One of the things we didn't talk about was LTIs and integration issues. And I want to address that very um, briefly right now, there is a thing called the Student Digital Ecosystem. There's a person looking into what are the 
legal ramifications at the university level with some of these third party tools. Um, a lot of them will take your students' data and do whatever with it, right? And instructors will sometimes say, yes, I'm going to sign my class up for this without recognizing that that's really shady bad practice. So <coughs> legal ramifications, things like does it play well or will it break in Canvas or will it, you know, what are all these other issues with that? So that's a process that we're just starting to get involved in because in the past it was instructor, do whatever you want, use whatever tools you want, and it's all good. We don't care. That has changed. That is changing every day. It continues to change a little bit more as student data gets and privacy issues get pressed to the foreground more and more. And the university is held responsible for those decisions that the instructors make about integrating these tools. So that is a to be determined continuation, um, a story that will continue to evolve and develop. <coughs> We are out of time. James has a... Just, just on that point, we actually literally a year ago hired somebody specifically to tackle that issue in AT. And it's been tough sledding. But it's a big it's issue. It's something that has been recognized as being an issue and as needing to be addressed. We're out of time. If you would please on your way out, um, check a couple boxes, write a few things, or you, you can look over your shoulder and see what your neighbors are writing and check the same boxes. <laughs> That'd be okay. Uh, just make sure that your name's up top. No. Yes, you can have that one. And this topic, as with all of the ones in the previous um, first half of the semester, every topic that was on a Wednesday, the second half of the semester will be on a Friday, and every one that was on a Friday will be on a Wednesday in the second half. So if you like the topic and you want to see it more, come to the lab on this on a Friday. I don't know when it is, but there's a special on the way out the door. Thank you for coming. <laughs>